Well, hello, folks. My name is Gary L. Wimmer. I'm honored to be here, and I'm honored to tell you a very interesting story, in fact, a couple of them. Uh, I'm 75. I got inter interested in psychic ability back in college in the late 60s, reading a lot of Edgar Cayce, Madame Blavatsky, and I was studying electrical engineering. Of course, it was Vietnam. Uh, I got out of college with an electrical engineering degree, and I was a conscientious objector because I was not in favor of the war, certainly. Uh, I started playing music, and I also had a um, couple of astrologers, both in college and when I moved to Austin, Texas in 1970, do uh, astrology charts for me. And both of them confirmed I had a lot of interest and ability in uh, natural psychic ability. Well, I was kind of curious about that, and I started giving readings in the early 70s, mostly with a regular deck of playing cards, uh, and I got fairly good at it. Uh, I started traveling a lot as a musician, uh, and in 1977, I had the most incredible experience I could ever have, uh, actually probably one of the most incredible experiences anybody could have, uh, a near-death experience. Uh, they're all different. People experience them in all kinds of situations, have all sorts of realizations, but there's a com couple of common threads, uh, which I will mention. So 1977, it was January 31st. I had left a band. I needed some time off. Um, I packed my gear back in my duplex where I lived and a couple of roommates and friends were there and we started talking. And I started getting premonitions about what people are gonna say all of a sudden. And that was kind of startling. Went to bed that night, couldn't sleep at all. I was awake, wide awake, going through my whole life. The next day I woke, well, I woke up, I got up, walked into the living room. My roommate's coming in with the paper, newspaper, and I saw the headlines through his eyes. Boy, that shocked me. He threw the paper down on the table. I looked at it and I was stunned because I just seen it through his eyes. He looks at me, you okay? Yeah. Well, things started getting stranger and stranger. I walked down to the store a while later, a couple hours later. I could hear people's thoughts. I could pick up things. This built up and up. That night we went to a bar and I noticed I was picking up things about all kinds of people. And I got kind of claustrophobic in the band room, came back, sat at the bar, still claustrophobic, picking up stuff about people all the time. Couldn't cut it off, had no idea why. I decided maybe I need a break, take a walk outside, and all of a sudden I'm standing outside. And I feel these people walk right through me. I opened up my eyes, I'm still in the bar stool, the door opened, the people came through dressed exactly as I'd seen them a moment ago. That was strange. And I started imagining myself going outside and seeing people and sitting back in my chair and it worked. My roommate came in, told him about that. He was concerned, I was concerned, because by the second or third day, this had built up this psychic ability to nothing I'd have ever experienced. And I could not tell what normal life was like anymore. I couldn't even remember. I scared, yeah, I was starting to get scared, but I was also never felt so enlightened and so empowered. It was like a very thin, tight wire of reality. And I had no choice but to uh, walk down it, because I didn't know what was happening or why. Didn't know how to turn it off, so I went with it. Third and fourth day, things got stranger and stranger. And I'll give you an example. My roommate and I were out at lunch one day, and he's asking me about this because he's observing me getting stranger and stranger. And rather than try to explain it to him, I pointed over to the corner of the restaurant to two ladies, asked him if he knew any of them, either of them. He looked over and said, no. And I said, well, I'm going to have the brunette write me a letter. What? I said, I'm going to have her write me a letter. As we ate, he completely forgot about that, but I didn't. I kept thinking of that brunette and drawing a mental, <laughs> sort of like an arrow, like a laser beam over to my table to tell her to write me a letter. Didn't look at her, didn't walk that way. The reason I was doing that is because the intensity of my psychic ability was, was building up so much, I couldn't ignore it. I was either picking up stuff or injecting stuff, but there was no neutral. Thus, this harmless little uh, test, I suppose, challenge, write me a letter, stranger. Well, 10 minutes later, when they were leaving, she and her friend walked by. She was the second person, threw down a napkin 
on which she'd written in big bold letters, why are you doing this to me? Boy, did that shock me. Things got stranger and stranger and stranger. Uh, I was uh, able to hear things, tell who's on the phone. I'd go meet people and I'd tell them before I'd even get there what time I'm going to be there because I would see a clock. Uh, I got very concerned. Of course, so did my roommates. Now, I started feeling this sort of feeling of these monitors, guardian angels. They seemed to almost name themselves the monitors. I didn't see them, but I kept feeling them. I kept feeling kind of give me a sense of security, like, no, you're not going completely crazy. There is uh, a meaning behind this. That's sort of the feeling I got, comforting. But I was still going through this intense, intense realization of um, the thin wall between our conscious and subconscious mind is important. But mine had vaporized. I could feel everything consciously that my subconscious was feeling. Thoughts, patterns, numbers, symbols. I'd have a question and I'd look out into the street and see something symbolic that would answer my question. I would look down the street at some random stranger and I would think, point your hand up toward the top of that building and they would do it instantly. And that freaked me out. I didn't know if they were about to do that and I just happened to pick it up or if I made that happen or some combination thereof. And that made me very scared of every little thought I had. I have never been so aware of every thought. Every thought affects something. So I had to keep this in incredible sense of balance. This went on for about a week. I wrote a book called The Second and Eternity, which clearly describes everything I went through. After a week of this, I was terrified. I have never felt so enlightened and so terrified, but I couldn't take it. I couldn't take it anymore. I didn't know how to turn it off. And I was pacing down Guadalupe Street here in Austin, Texas, and I was in tears. I was frantic. I was praying. I was crying. People on the street were looking at me like, what's wrong with this guy? It didn't bother me at all because I was at wit's end. And finally, at the middle of one of these intense prayers, I felt instantly warm, instantly. And I looked up and there's this huge light above me. And I was mind blown. I looked around at the people who were watching me because there was kind of a crowd around me watching me as I had been pacing down the street, crying and frantically praying. Well, they didn't see this light, obviously. I don't know how they could have ignored it, but I looked up and I realized it was a thin, oh, about that thick, like a crystal table. And these seven monitors, guardian angels, were looking through down to me and the light was coming from the palms of their hands. I realized they were the monitors. And I said, wow, you're the monitors. And they said, yes, do you trust us? And I said, oh, I don't know what's happening. I'm so lost, this is intense. Do you trust us? In one big voice, real warm, very comforting. And I had lost all fear. All fear immediately vaporized as soon as I saw them. I looked around at the people in the street they didn't see it. They didn't. They just saw me talking to an empty sky, I suppose, but they were real. And within just a second or two, I was involved in a head-on collision with a speeding car. Wham! I was outside my body. I saw my body tumbling over the car. And I felt this strange sense of detachment. Sort of like, well, that's just what happens on Earth. So I started expanding outward like a balloon in all directions. The whole earth became a little bitty dot. And I remember seeing the whole earth from 360, all top, bottom, north, south, east, west, like a globe that was inside me because I was expanding like a balloon. And pretty soon I had no awareness of me, no awareness of uh, life on earth other than me expanding or my psyche expanding went beyond the edge of the universe. I saw infinite universes. They seemed to twine up into a big circular cloud like a tunnel of light. I was pulled through this tunnel of light. I ended up in this infinite blue void of perfection, infinite mind. I didn't real I didn't feel like I was an observer. I felt like I was part of it. At home, back. No separation, certainly no awareness of myself or earth or where I just left. 
And it felt like I was there for an infinity, eternity. That's why I named the book A Second and Eternity. It was the most mind-boggling thing impossible to describe other than infinite mind making infinite possibilities through infinite time and infinite space with no limitation and no bias, no beginning, no end. Everything we experience is nothing more than infinite mind looking at itself, whether it's a, a molecule of water or in a, or in a galaxy or, in, uh, or our souls. Everything is infinite mind looking at itself. And I had never even thought about that. It was, I was absolutely mind blown. I say I, I still didn't know who I was, but I was pulled from it by a term that I described in the book of spiritual gravity. I had no idea where I was being pulled back to or towards. I knew where I was, was beautiful. But faster and faster, I started being pulled back through the same experience I went through, back through this tunnel of light started collapsing back into this universe, into this galaxy, saw my body on earth, people screaming and hollering, car wreck. I recognized my body. I immediately jumped into it. Well, I'd just been to heaven. That was the most beautiful experience in my life. I felt no pain whatsoever. I did see the car banged up. And this guy with long red hair was leaning over me, screaming, Are you hurt, man? I tried to stop. I couldn't stop. Well, I had felt no pain whatsoever. I felt hell. Like I'd just been to heaven. I jumped to my feet and started asking people if they'd seen these monitors, you know. Um, well, it got stranger and stranger. The driver tried to calm me down and say I was in shock. I'm not in shock. I'm doing fine. I'm not hurt. How do you know you're not hurt? Oh, it got real crazy real quick. So I was going to go home and I could hear the sirens coming. And some people said, just hang around till you talk to the police. And I thought, okay, I'll just explain this and go home. <laughs> right. So cops came, police came. They're all wondering how I did not even feel this car wreck. There was no blood. I wasn't hurt. In fact, when they arrived, they were looking around for the body in the street. And I said, I'm the guy you're looking for. And all the witnesses were pointing toward me. Well, I couldn't explain to them simply how I wasn't hurt, even though they kept asking, how did you walk? Not a, it had no blood, no pain, no whatsoever. And the whole front of the car is towed in, piled in. A little heavy for them, real heavy for me. But they couldn't just let me go home. They took me to the emergency room, x-rayed me. Wasn't hurt at all. They confirmed that. Didn't know how. But then a man came in to talk to me, and I'd seen a premonition about him, and he was a psychiatrist. I knew all about it. I'd seen it a couple of days earlier. He was mind blown. Have I ever met you before? I said, no. But I know everything right now. I'm just picking this up. You know, I explained to him how I knew I wasn't hurt. Explained to him I could pick up anything, even describe some stuff about his family to him right in front of me. Blew his mind. But it was kind of the norm for me. He said, well, we can't let you just out of the hospital. You're not hurt. We're going to have to put you uh, in jail um, for under a protective custody orders because we have to commit you to a psychiatric hospital. I did not care. I'd been to heaven. You can put me anywhere. Put me in jail for a couple of days till they got a protective order. I went to the psychiatric hospital and uh, I explained to my doctor and everybody else what happened. Of course, they didn't believe it. And I understand my lithium level was high. The indications were uh, I'd gone through a manic phase of bipolar nature. I am bipolar. I realized that. But the experience I had was real. Ten days later, when you're getting released from the psychiatric hospital, they all, all the psychiatrists want to talk to you, make sure you're okay, whether to extend the 10 day commitment or let me free. I told him what happened. I said, look, you guys can keep me here forever. I'm not changing my story. This is what happened. And you as psychiatrists and doctors ought to explore this. I never even knew anybody could go to infinite mind and come back. Uh, woo, did I know differently then? That was in 1977. Seven months later, I kept asking, why did I have this? No complaints. I felt like the luckiest person on the planet, but why me? What did I possibly do to deserve this? Seven months later, the monitors came back. I didn't see them this time. They shot a message into my brain, which is described in this book. And it basically said, you had this experience because you've always asked. You always wanted to know. You were ready. You could 
handle the truth, so to speak. They took me, they brought me back, and they confirmed that, yeah, it's going to be a shock, so you're going to have a bunch of grounding agents, family, cops, police, psychiatric hospital, which was necessary because I needed to be grounded. They were grounding agents. Told me a lot about what was happening, and when I was coming back into my body, I saw what I described that were going on, and and now I saw the next hundred years on this planet. I saw 9/11, I saw COVID-19, I saw wars and anger and hostility and frustration that we're going through now. But I also saw why, because we are seeing the holes in the boat, the holes in our systems, the flaws, so we can fix them. And that's what the whole world is going through now. I saw that in '77. We've got, you know, a generation of or two of healing and cleaning up and getting our planet right and getting our consciousness right. That's why we're seeing all this chaos now. That's why a lot of people are asking questions. Good. That's why more and more people are having near-death experiences. And as I said, the one of the most common things, everybody who has an NDE um, experiences is infinite love. Experiences are quite different, very across the board. I experienced the same thing. When I saw infinite creativity, infinite mind, unbiased, I realized that the source of it was infinite love. Now, how infinite love makes infinite creativity and manifests into all these molecules and atoms and galaxies and planets and people, who knows? Beyond the rules of science. But that's what's happening. In 1970, excuse me, 1980s, I uh, met a lady named Alice Warhol who did readings by a method called lithomancy. I'd been given readings since early 70s, mid 70s. I was fascinated by it. Uh, she showed me how she gave readings. Actually, she put on a course and it was raining and I was the only one who showed up. So she showed me rather quickly and I started practicing the next day. It's a method of using 16 stones to predict the next 12 weeks read it like a clock drop the stones read it like a clock 12 o'clock three o'clock six o'clock nine o'clock complete instructions in there about how to use symbolism and stones and read symbolism to interpret uh things about people situations so that is what i learned in 1980 lithomancy i still do readings that way if you're interested in contacting me, you can look up lithomancy.com, L-I-T-H-O-M-A-N-C-Y.com, or you can Google Gary L. Wimmer, uh, and you can check out my books on Amazon and Kindle, A Second in Eternity about my NDE, and Lithomancy, The Psychic Art of Reading Stones. Again, I'm honored to be on this show, and I hope to encourage people who are watching, stay empowered. Have faith. It's really a challenging time for humankind. Indeed it is. But we will survive. And uh, I always have sort of a uh, theory that, well, if you if you don't make it, if you die, you're in heaven. No problem. If you're still here on earth, there's still things to learn. There's still things to uh, benefit from, to grow. There's still love. There's still virtues. There's still empowerment. By the way, there's no limit to how much we can grow and become empowered on the inside. There's a limit to how many years we'll live, how fast we can drive down the highway, whatever. There's no limit to how much we can grow spiritually, psychically, mentally, with creativity, ambition, concern, love, morals, values, virtues. Those are all on the inside, and there's no limit. I would have never thought that had an unexperienced, what I call infinite mind in just two seconds three seconds of earth time. So I know for a fact, we are all connected to this infinite mind and we can all make use of it. That's the key. How? Well, meditate. Learn to turn off your logical mind five minutes a day. Learn to let your spirituality come through. Learn to think big. Ask your guides for help. If you ask your guides for help and you meditate and you have good intentions, you'll probably get what you're looking for. And if not everything, which you won't, you'll get a lot more because intentions and attitude are everything. We can't change the past, so don't drive yourself crazy over that. We can't change other people, 
So don't drive yourself crazy over that. There's 10 billion things we can't change. Don't drive yourself crazy over that. Think of what you can change. Think of how much you can grow. Think of how much you can learn. Think how much you can forgive and grow and evolve and put things in context. Believe it. Your attitude, your contribution to higher consciousness adds to the collective pool. Nothing has to be in vain. We can learn from everything. And I have been through such severe depression in my life and such grand ecstasy that I've seen both extremes. And I know life is always going to give us cycles. There's going to be tough cycles and there's going to be very rewarding cycles. But for a fact, we can make the tough learning cycles shorter and more meaningful by the same method as we can make the good cycles longer. How? What's life telling me? If you're not succeeding, if you're hurting, if you're angry, if you're hitting your thumb with the hammer, well, move the hammer, move the thumb, change. You don't have to stay stuck there. So you can make those learning cycles shorter and more meaningful. Things are going good, stretch it out. You know, if, if, if you're the thing you're doing is working, do it more every day and get better at it. We are not stuck. Nothing is in vain. Everything can have meaning and you can learn from everything. But we have to turn our fears around. We have to turn our worried minds off. It's proactive. Ask and you shall receive. That's true. We don't get everything. Knock and the door shall be open. It's true. Not everything. But the more we decide to work on and the more we ask for our guides to help and the more we have good intentions and the more we do our part, practice, because everything in life comes because of decision and practice on the achievement side. We're going to get accidents. We're going to get curveballs, but we can learn from those too. So my message is stay empowered. See the light in yourself. See the light in other people. There's no limit to how much we can grow but it is a constant process. And just like we have to change the oil in our car, we have to change the way we think. And we have to do it proactively, just like we have to shape our car to the mechanic to get the oil changed. So stay empowered, folks. It's been an honor to be with you this afternoon, this evening, this morning. It's actually uh, March 10th, 2023, when I'm talking to you, I'm 75. I don't know if I've got another five minutes or two decades, but I'm a little bit happy and inspired and creative and always, always, always looking for light, seeking light and hoping to expand upon it, show it to other people. Since I realized in 1977 that we're all connected to infinite mind, I've had a commitment to let people know that, to encourage them to see it. Because the more you grow, the more you add to the whole world's higher consciousness.